last 30 years, the forces of autocracy. The Russian army is committing barbaric actions. Welcome to lecture number nine in our mini series on understanding the war. And today we are actually going to look a little bit about the world and international relations beyond the war. And today we'll be dealing with the concept of power uh, in international relations. And you should see this lecture in conjunction with the next one uh, where we talk about 10 instruments of power. But let's focus on power first and uh, as custom has it, uh, for all of us to be able to follow, I'll do a little bit of an introduction and then I'll have three points. Number one, on the kinds of power that exist. Number two, on the size of power. And number three, on the players of power, before I then uh, conclude. So let's kick uh, off uh, today's lecture uh, by a general observation. I think it's a fallacy, or in many ways wrong, to think about power uh, in one place, somehow static or concentrated. I actually think that power doesn't exist in a vacuum. It is varied and it is diluted rather than static uh, and concentrated. So power vacuums emerge around the world throughout history. And usually when they emerge, there is someone who goes in and tries to grab that power, what it means. So the whole concept of power, to think that in the future we'll have one superpower that's going to rule the world. No, it's not going to happen. So in many ways, power is a little bit like Foucault's pendulum, right? It oscillates from one side to the other. And then obviously, as the world moves around, the globe circulates, it goes in all kinds of different directions. So don't think that power is static or concentrated, it is much more varied and diluted. So let's have a look at power and the kinds of power. Now, in international relations, we quite often talk about three types of power. Hard power, soft power and smart power. Uh, and there's a lot of wonderful literature about this. Uh, one of my favorite authors is actually Joe Nye, who you could say coined um, soft power as such. But let's begin to look at these different forms of power. So the first one is hard. And that's really the sort of classic, you know, uh, military and economic power, if you will. It's quite often coercive. So hard power is the kind of a stuff that you can project on, on someone else. So basically, let's give an example. Finland lives next to Russia. Russia has a huge military, including uh, a nuclear arsenal. That tells the Finns that those guys have a lot of hard power. Let's try to think on how to get along with them uh, without causing too much of a havoc. The same thing goes with the economy. You know, if you are big, you have a big economy, uh, you have a lot of money, you have strong financial instruments, you have power and you can actually use that coercively. So hard power is the sort of the muscle of, of international uh, relations, if you will. Now, soft power, the second category, is a little bit different. Now, soft power, coming back to Joe Nye, it's sort of the attractive power. So if you realize that, you know, I'm not super good at this hard power stuff, you sort of show that you have pretty good cultural capability, if you will, or values. So you show that, that you're attractive. So let, let, let's take the Nordic countries as an example, right? So, you know, Denmark, Finland, Sweden, uh, uh, and, and Norway and Iceland. Now, these countries, you know, in terms of size, uh, okay, you put them together and they're probably the ninth largest economy in the world, but it's not exactly like we have a lot of hard power. Yeah, we have strong militaries and, and yes, eventually all of us will be in NATO, but, you know, we're not traditional. But what are we? You know, we are quite attractive powers in the sense that, you know, we, we show a set of a value base on, on liberal democracy, 
uh, equality, you know, education, uh, uh, welfare society, human rights, fundamental rights, transparency, freedom of press. You know, they're good places to live in. So it shows that, you know, there's this sort of attractive power that, that, that we can have. Then there's a third form of power, which is generally called smart power. Now, what does smart power do? Essentially, it combines hard power, so the military and economic might, with the soft power, sort of the attractiveness, the culture and, and the values. And it, in many ways, when it combines these two, it gives a holistic approach to, to what power can be. It doesn't have to be aggressive or hard, but it cannot only be soft. It can probably be a, a combination of the two. Smart power is also forging alliances around the world and cooperating and seeing how you can maximize your own space of, of power. So we have hard power, soft power and smart power. And those are backed up with what I'm going to actually talk about in the next lecture, instruments of power where I hope to bring in something new to this whole debate about what power actually means. But let me just suspend your curiosity uh, until the next lecture on that one. So these were the kinds of power that we have, point number one. Point number two, what then is the size of power? Well, here I'm still focused on slightly old-fashioned thinking about, you know, nation-states, but I'll, I'll, I'll sort of um, go against my own argument on point number three, but let's suspend that uh, for a second. So, you know, size of power is pretty much determined by the wealth of a country, uh, the demography, in other words, your population, uh, the geography, your size and natural resources, probably, you know, your, your military as well, and to a certain extent, your general influence or capacity to project power. So it's sort of a combination of, of power that, that, that is pushed forward and gives you a certain statute or state stature in the world. So let's say, you know, the size of power, the, the superpowers of the Cold War were the Soviet Union uh, and the United States for, for various reasons. They were, they were huge superpowers. Now, in today's world, I don't believe that we are anymore going to have one or two or three superpowers. But what we will have is what I call big powers, medium powers, and perhaps small powers, which are linked to the hard power, soft power, and smart power. So you're going to have big powers like China, just because of share economic wealth and demography. Uh, the United States, same thing, and the European Union. They are more or less each 16% of the world economy with different types of strengths. They're not superpowers, but they're big powers. So the European Union, to a certain extent, is a uh, regulatory superpower, though active nowadays. The United States is an economic and military and technological superpower. And, the Ch and China as well. So these are sort of big powers, right? And very different. One is a centralized state, the other one is a decentralized state, and the European Union, of course, is more than an international organization, less than a state. But big powers with a lot of influence, both in the hard field, the soft field, and the smart field. Secondly, you have medium powers. So here we're talking about traditional big states like, for instance, India, South Africa, Nigeria, uh, Brazil, you know, Japan, South Korea. But don't forget that, you know, you could start at some stage seeing some of these medium powers forging smart power alliances like the African Union and actually become huge players, uh, you know, in, in global politics. But they are, at this stage, for all intents and purposes, I would argue, medium. And then, of course, you have small powers. I mentioned the Nordics earlier. I think, you know, the Benelux countries, so Belgium, uh, Luxembourg, and, and, and uh, uh, the Netherlands are examples of, of small powers. There are many, 
influential and important small powers all around the world. You know, in, in, in the Gulf region, uh, Middle East, in, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, uh, etc., etc. So these are my sort of thinking on, on the size of power. Quite variable, but no superpowers uh, in the future. My third and final point today is then about the players of power. Uh, what are they like? Now, here I come to perhaps a slightly untraditional way of thinking. I think it's old-fashioned or old-school to think about purely state power, right? Now, yeah, the state, as created by, you know, Westphalia in the 1800s, uh, is an important entity. I, I'm not denying that. But in today's world, you know, the states have coercive power, so they can decide on whether to, you know, use violence or, or whatever they end up doing. Uh, they also maintain law and order, fine, and they have a very strong redistributive value because of their economic and fiscal, and at the end of the day also, uh, you know, financial or, or monetary policy. I'm not denying that they are not an important entity, they are, but I still think that when you look at players of power, you need to go beyond that. And I don't say this only because I'm a director at the School of Transnational Governance. In other words, basically power which is projected both beyond, below and uh, through the state. But my argument is that we have to look at power from the eyes of transnational players. And that basically means that international institutions have a lot of power. Companies have a lot of power. NGOs and civil society have a lot of power. Media has a lot of power. Academia has a lot of power. Cities have a lot of power. Regions have a lot of power. And us, as individuals, have a lot of power. So my argument is that it's simplistic and old-fashioned to think that the only players of power are actually states. Why do we use them all the time? Well, because they're fairly easy entities to understand. You know, they have borders in a fairly borderless world. They have legislative power. They have legal power, they have coercive power, but they are not the only ones that decide. So let me give you one example. Who do you feel is more powerful and influential in this world? Facebook or, say, Finland? I guess I can say that because I'm a Finn. Well, you draw the conclusion, but what I'm saying is that if Facebook has a couple of billion, uh, you know, subscribers and users, the power that it has it's not hard power, military, but it is soft power and it is smart power. And it can use that power in different kinds of ways. So when I talk about the kinds of power, hard, soft, smart, the size of power, big, medium, small, and the players of power understand that the world is much, much more complex than we used to think. And here is my conclusion. Number one, Please understand that power is about detecting megatrends and movements. It is a combination of the hard, soft and smart power, and it is also very much about learning to adapt to what power actually means. Number two, avoid superpower or other power nostalgia. Don't look back at your own greatness in terms of history, or culture, or impact. Because when you do that, you become blinded to the future, and you don't understand where the nexus of power is actually moving uh, around. So if you want to categorize it into big power, medium power, and small power, if you're a big power and you want to maintain your position, do not only focus on military, because you will lose that status. Look, for instance, at Russia at this particular moment. If you are a medium-sized power, you really have to be diverse and play with the different instruments of power. If you are a small power, 
I would probably recommend that you find a niche and focus on that. But in the big picture, power is a super interesting concept. And right now, and probably for the foreseeable future, it'll be moving, like for calls pendulum, in all kinds of different directions. Remember, power is not static or concentrated. It is varied and diluted. Over the last 30 years, the forces of the Russian army is committing barbaric action.